Probably the easiest, most basic example of, of an application of multivariable integration is calculating volumes of various strange shapes trapped between surfaces. Um, it's uh, of the question is how important is it to be able to calculate these? Well, it's a good test of understanding how you calculate multivariable integrals and we need these skills in later sections when we want other applications to mass and centers of mass and things like that. So even if you don't think you'd ever care about the volumes of the shapes that we're going to look at, um, you should still care about the techniques. It shouldn't be too surprising that uh, to calculate volumes we can either take a triple integral or we can do a double integral and multiply little infinitesimal blobs of area times heights. And as we'll see, those are effectively the same in the problems we'll look at. And you could think of it either way you want, but later in other applications, the adding up little blobs of volume, little rectangular chunks of little boxes of volume, um, will be a, a better approach, a better way of thinking of it than adding finite height times an infinitesimal area. So we'll look at that. So let's just do an example. Um, let's start with so first example. Find the volume. Of a solid region S. below the graph of z equals 3 plus x squared over 4 minus y squared over 9 and above the rectangle in the xy plane. Where x is between 0 and 2. And y is between 0 and 3. All right. So there's the problem. Um, do you have to draw a picture of this? Well, I mean, actually, there's a computer-generated a computer graph in the book, but suppose that weren't there. Do you have to draw a picture of this? In theory, no, but it's much harder to work out most of these triple integral problems without some picture. It doesn't have to be particularly good. It needs to show you kind of the relevant data, what's above what, and you hope to see a projection you need to be able to kind of see a projection into either the xy plane, the xz plane, or the yz plane so that you can reduce your triple integral to a double integral and one single integral. So <clears throat> I do want to give a bad sketch of this, even though it's in the book. Oh, it won't be that awful, but that you should recognize as a hyperbolic paraboloid. Um, so a saddle. But it's lifted up three units. But what's, what's really crucial is that it's always above the xy plane for x and y in our regions. Now, that may not be obvious, but you can take it as a given, or you can do the extra work to show it. But it's um, certainly it's obvious from the picture that's in the book and the one I'm going to draw that all you get is some part, some kind of small part of this saddle, and we're looking at that part. So, yeah, what what are the important features that you need to get out of it, out of this picture? Actually, almost nothing except that. 
This is above the xy plane for all x's and y's in the rectangle that we're talking about. So z equals 3 plus x squared over 4 minus y squared over 9. So this is our solid region S. You should think of that as being filled in. And as we did in the last section, to evaluate, so what do we want? We want to find a triple integral. We want the volume. Well, how do you get the volume? Well, you take a triple integral over the solid region of, well, this is a continuous sum. As you move over the solid region, what do you have to add up to get volume? Well, little blobs of volume. So just dv, or if you want to think of it, it's 1 times dv. So the integrand is 1, but you frequently, usually don't see the one written. You just write dv, add up little blo infinitesimal blobs of volume, add them up continuously to get the whole volume. Our question is, well, how do we write this? How do we write this as an iterated integral? And as we discussed in the last section, you need to decide which way you're going to project it. Now, you could project into the xz plane or into the um, yz plane, but it's set up so that it's already described you as the solid region over a certain region in the xy plane. Well, that immediately tells you what the projection in the xy plane is. It's that region that you were told the solid region lies above. So we're going to project into the xy plane where we'll just get our rectangle. So in the xy plane, our projection will be the, the rectangle that was described to us at the beginning, the rectangle where x is between 0 and 2 and y is between 0 and 3. I'll call this region, this plane region, r. And then this triple integral is the double integral over r of, OK, we projected into the xy plane. That means we got rid of z. That means our inside integral is the z integral. And then we still need to integrate with respect to a. The z integral for each xy pair in your, in your rectangle, your z coordinates in the solid region start down here at 0 and go up to the z coordinate on the um, hyperbolic paraboloid on the saddle. That's it. You know, at any xy pair, your z coordinate starts down in the xy plane, so that starts at z equals 0, and goes up to a point on the hyperbolic paraboloid. So your z coordinates, they're always starting at 0, and they're going up to 3 plus x squared over 4 minus y squared over 9. So that's what you get for the limits of integration on z. And then you integrate over the rectangle r. But integrating over a rectangle is easy. You just get constants for the limits of integration. So I'll just go ahead and change that to an iterated integral. y goes from 0 to 3. x goes from 0 to 2. And this is the iterated integral that we need to calculate to calculate the volume. I don't like how close that is. To calculate the volume of our solid region. All right, so we'll do this. Uh, the integral of just dz is z, or whether you think of it as dz or 1 times dz, is just z. Um, so we get the volume equals the integral as x goes from 0 to 2, y is going from 0 to 3, and the integral of z is of dz is just z. So we get z evaluated from z equals 0 to z equals 3 plus x squared over 4 minus y squared over 9. We have a dy and a dx. So you get integral from 0 to 2, the integral from 0 to 3, 3 plus x squared over 4 minus y squared over 9. I'll go ahead and write minus 0 because there is a point I want to make times. Now let me, well, I'll write dy dx, but I do want to back up for a minute. This was dA. 
Notice that after we do the inside integral, the one with z in it, what you've got is the top z coordinate minus the bottom z coordinate times little blobs of area. So you've got heights, you know, these are heights of something, times little blobs of area. What's going on there, or one way to think of what's going on there, if you took a little chunk of area in the xy plane, then instead of integrating, then instead of taking little infinitesimal dz's and taking little infinitesimal boxes with infinitesimal volumes, we could take that little infinitesimal chunk of area and multiply it times the finite height that goes all the way up here and gives you a little rectangular solid. So a rectangular solid with a finite height instead of an infinitesimal height times a little blob of dA. And so we could have thought of calculating the volume with a double integral in the first place. Instead of thinking, oh, it's a triple integral, my z coordinates always start down here and go up here. You can think, oh, I take little blobs of area here, multiply times height. It's the same thing. In fact, we're evaluating using Fubini's theorem, and this is the idea of the proof of Fubini's theorem, that those things are the same. Um, so that, um, yeah, you can, you can think of it as a triple integral of dv, or you could think of it in the first place as a double integral over r of the height times dA. And then height times dA, you get these tall, you know, tall compared to an infinitesimal height, these tall um, rectangular solids with an infinitesimal volume, and you add those up continuously. Does it matter which way you think of this? Not really, because after you do this first inside integral with respect to z, you're here. So in volume problems, it doesn't really matter whether you whether you think of it as a double integral of height, or if it were laid out a different way, maybe length or width, times a little blob of area, versus adding up little infinitesimal boxes of volume. But in other problems later that we come to, it does matter. Because here, the height would be a function of your x and y coordinate. This would be a function of x and y. And if you're integrating some other function, like a density function, it would need to just depend on x and y. But if you had a density function that depended on x, y, and z, then you'd need to set it up like this and put the density function there, not like this, putting the density function there. So my point is that setting it up as a triple integral instead of the double integral of height is no harder because as soon as you do that, the first inside integral is going to just give you z or x or y in another problem. And then you'll immediately take that difference and you'll get, you'll get height or length or width. And so you'll immediately reduce yourself to this. But if you think of it this way, then in later problems where you're integrating functions that aren't constant, might depend on x, y, and z, you'll be used to doing the right thing. So I'm going to treat these as triple integrals. But if you prefer thinking of them as double integrals of height, that's fine too. All right. Well, now we have to actually finish this. So that's kind of the boring part of the problem, uh, actually getting the answer. Uh, it's kind of, it's very, uh, it's very easy to make small mistakes, so I'll try to be careful. We're integrating with respect to y. Always important to know what you're integrating with respect to. So we get 3y, x, is, x squared over 4 is a constant as far as y is concerned. But then with re, when you integrate with respect to y, here you get y cubed over 27, then we need to evaluate as y goes from 0 to 3. And we still need, to, after that, we still need to integrate with respect to x. So we get the integral from 0 to 2 of, tell me, I'll get it. You put in y is 3, you get 9. And then here, you get 3 fourths x squared. And here you get minus 27 over 27, so minus 1. And then you subtract what you get when y is 0, but that's 0. So we just get this. 9 minus 1 is 8. So we end up having to integrate 8. 
dx, so I get 8x plus x cubed over 4, evaluated from 0 to 2. When you put in 2, I get 16. And then 2 cubed, 8 divided by 4, 2 plus 2, minus what you get at 0, which is 0, so I get 18. Is that what I got in the book? Yes. <laughs> so, so that's the volume of that solid region, 18. 18 watts, well, it depends on what your x, y, and z's were measured in. So if x, y, and z were measured in meters, 18 cubic meters. All right, let's look at a different example. Um, again, not, I'll, not particularly difficult. Again, you need a picture that's good enough, actually, really, just to tell you when one thing is above another thing. Um, in this one, I'm going to have two planes, but I'm going to describe, and again, it's going to be above a region in the xy plane, but it won't be a rectangle. So, example, find the region, find the volume of the region. Between the two planes, given by z equals x plus y, and z equals 1 plus 2x plus 3y. And above the triangle with vertices, one zero 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 one zero and two one zero. All right, first of all, yeah, so there are two planes. Um, in the last problem, I was saying, oh, well, you'd have to do some extra work to actually know that that uh, hyperbolic paraboloid was always above the xy plane for x and y in the region that we had. But at least in this one, at least in this problem, which one of these is above which one is obvious. So we've got two planes. I'm not going to try to draw them in the right positions necessarily. Planes are hard to draw because they have so few features to give them perspective. So the basic problem is we've got two planes. And then we've got some triangular region, which I'm also not going to try to draw in the correct position. Well, it just depends on how things are rotated. But you've got um, some triangle beneath this, and what you're looking at is the triangular region, or not the triangular region, the kind of prism-like region that's above, <laughs> that's above that triangle in between the two planes. So the solid that solid region, region trapped between two planes and above a triangle. Now, how good does your picture need to be? It doesn't even have to be as good as mine, and mine's not very good. What you need to know is one of the planes is always above the other one when for x's and y's in that triangle. Is that obviously true this time, and which, which plane is above which? Actually, it should be obvious because those three points are points in the x-y plane because the z coordinates are all zero. And those three points are x is 1, x is 1, y and z are 0, um, y is 1, x and z are 0, and then x is 2 and y is 1. 
So this is 2, 1, 1. We're talking about this triangle. Um, yeah. So in particular, those x's and y's are all greater than or equal to 0. Well, if x and y are greater than or equal to 0, look, this is, you've added 1, you've added another x, and you've added 2 more y, but x and y are greater than or equal to 0. So you, this z-coordinate is definitely bigger than this z-coordinate for any x and y in the first quadrant. So um, in this first quadrant of the xy plane. So yes, it's, this one is higher than this one. In fact, you don't need to draw the picture after you know that. It's just like our last problem, except now our projected region in the xy plane, since the problem is described to us as, as above this region in the xy plane, that means if we project in the xy plane, we get that triangle. So it's just like the last problem, except instead of a rectangle as our projected region in the xy plane, we get this triangle, and we'll have to, we'll have to deal with that. We might as well go ahead and identify equations for these line segments. This is where you can do it a different way, but clearly this is where x plus y is 1, that line. You can just verify that x and y are 1, or you can realize it has slope minus 1, or the same as y equals minus x plus 1. Slope minus 1, y-intercept 1. Um, and this line has slope 1. Its y-intercept is in the picture. It would actually be minus 1. But you can verify that it passes through these two points when x is 1, y is 0. Good. When x is 2, y is 1. Yeah. So, um, all right. So what do we want to do? We want to, it's, it's like our last integral. I mean, kind of at this point. It's, we want to have a double integral over our new projected region R, this triangle of, once again, since we project in the xy plane, dz is on the inside. Your z coordinate goes from the smaller one, from the plane where z equals x plus y, up to the plane where z equals 1 plus 2x plus 3y. And then out here we've got dA, and we'll hold off on deciding whether we want to integrate with respect to dx on the outside or with dy on the outside. After you do this first, that inside integral, well, again, just as in the last problem, the integral of dz is just z, and then you put in that and subtract that, so you are quickly at where you would be with a double integral. The double integral over r of 1 plus 2x plus 3y minus the quantity x plus y. And we still have a dA here. So we need to do the double integral over r of 1 plus x plus 2y dA. All right. So what do you do? Well, it's just, a, it's just an integrating over this triangle problem now. So we've got this double integral over r of 1 plus x plus 2y dA. And the question is, how do we write this as an iterated integral? And the answer is, well, there are two choices, neither of which is terrible, but one which is a little more, I don't know if it's easier, but it's certainly more elegant than the other. If you put the dx integral on the outside, then your x coordinates go from 0 to 2. But then you have to split things up when x is less than or equal to 1 and when x is greater than or equal to 1 because when your x-coordinate is less than or equal to 1, your y-coordinates go from this line up to this line. But then suddenly when you're greater than 1, that line doesn't matter anymore and your y-coordinates go from this, line, from this line up to that line. On the other hand, if you put dy on the outside so that you're integrating, so let me go ahead and write that because that is what we're going to do. So we're going to put dy on the outside. That means dx is on the inside. Your y-coordinates go from 
0 to 1. And then when you're at some y coordinate from 0 to 1, your x coordinates always go from this line over that line. So your x coordinate starts at the x coordinate on this line and goes over the x coordinate on that line. In terms of y, the x coordinate on that line is x equals 1 minus y, right? This is the same as x equals 1 minus y. So your, your x always starts at 1 minus y, and it goes up to x equals, well, this is, you put the 1 over there, it's x equals 1 plus y to 1 plus y. And those are your limits of integration, and now we just have to do, actually compute. <laughs> In these multiple integral problems, it is frequently the case that the difficulty is setting up the limits of integration for the iterated integral, and it's not the actual calculation. The calculation can be tedious, and it it's, um, you know, can be, it's easy to make small mistakes, but it's not difficult, usually. So you get x plus x squared over 2. We're integrating with respect to x plus 2xy. You evaluate as x goes from 1 minus y to 1 plus y. And then after you do that, you still have to, after you do that, we're still going to have to integrate with respect to y. So you get the integral from 0 to 1 of 1 plus y plus 1 plus y quantity squared over 2 plus 2 times 1 plus y times y. Yuck. We don't need this anymore. And then you subtract what you get when x is 1 minus y. So you subtract 1 minus y plus 1 minus y squared over 2 plus 2 times 1 minus y times y. And then you have to integrate all of that still with respect to y. Yuck, as I said, the calculation can be a little tedious. Uh, they can be lengthy. And I, I shouldn't have said that they're not usually hard. The reason they're not usually difficult is because we pick ones that aren't difficult. You could, of course, make the integrals arbitrarily awful. Um, all right. We need to multiply some stuff out, simplify, and then integrate. But we get a 1 plus y plus, we get a 1 plus 2y plus y squared over 2 plus um, if you multiply this out, you'll get a 2y plus 2y squared. And then there's a minus 1, a plus y, a minus, now you square this, 1 minus 2y plus y squared over 2. And then minus this, so here's another 2y, but it's minus, so minus 2y. And then minus 2y squared but that's hit by that, so plus 2y squared. Okay, yippee. <laughs> so what do you get? Well, some, uh, some stuff cancels and you can combine stuff. So let's see if I can get the same thing I got in the book. You've got a, a 1 cancels with a minus 1. Well, that was nice. There's a 2y and a minus 2y. All right, there's a 2y, so there's 2y, a y plus a y, so you get a 2y there. So let's go ahead and write another integral. The integral from 0 to 1, I'm getting a 2y right there. So I'm taking care of that one and that one. I'm not saying they cancel, I'm just indicating I've already counted them. So I get a 2y. When I subtract this, all right, the, they both have this and this. They both have the same denominator, 2. We get a 1 minus 1. Those cancel. We get a 2y minus minus 2y, so plus 4y over 2. So that's plus another 2y. But then you get a y squared over 2 minus y squared over 2. So those cancel. So now we've taken care of these. And we're left with a 2y squared plus a 2y squared, so plus a 4y squared. So all of that mess reduced to the integral from 0 to 1 
of 4y plus 4y squared <laughs> dy, you can pull out the 4 and you get times y squared over 2 plus y cubed over 3 as y goes from 0 to 1. You plug in y equals 1, subtract what you get at 0, which is 0. When you put in 1, you get a half plus a third. <laughs> That's 3, 6 plus 2, 6, 5, 6, 26, 10 thirds. 10 thirds. <laughs> as I said, you know, setting up the, the correct limits of integration is the, the thoughtful part. The uh, calculation, at least when you've got polynomials like this, you know, maybe there was some sneakier algebra we could have done. Oh, I could have factored out a 1 plus y here and factored out a 1 minus y. But, you know, you just have to do it. It's not like any part of it's hard and you just get the answer. All right. I want to do one more example, this time not projecting into the xy plane. Um, and just so we can have one where you project somewhere else. Um, it will help to draw this one, well, again, not incredibly well, but it really does help to have some at least vague sketch of the solid region. Of course, if you have a computer that can draw things for you in three dimensions, that is helpful, but even then, Getting the right perspective, turning it the right way, zooming in, zooming out, scaling the axes correctly, is not a particularly easy task. If, um, it's not that easy to see the features we're trying to see. So I want to take, I want to take, let S be the solid region. bounded by the graphs of y equals 0, z equals y, and z equals cosine of x. All right. Hmm. What do you do? Well, <laughs> this, you know, there's no y in this. Okay, well, y equals zero is easy. Y, if I would indicate the y-axis correctly, y equals zero is the xz plane. So that, our, our solid is just bounded by the, the yz plane over here. So I'm going to erase that so it won't be in my way, but it's bounded by the xz plane. Z equals Y describes a plane. It's the X coordinates missing, so you can just draw the line Y equals Z in the YZ plane and then just extend it along the X axis. So it's this slanted plane that comes up. It's, um, it's coming, yeah, I'm going to draw it better in a minute, but it's coming, yeah. It's going to be hard to draw this in perspective with all this mess in here. But if you think of a line that's right where my, let me move my x-axis a little bit because that's causing me a mild problem. Because what I want to do is draw a line that looks like it has slope 1 in the yz plane. And then you have a plane that's coming out like this and just extending along that x-axis. But the easiest thing to draw first is this. That is the cosine curve in the, in the xz plane, and then y gets to be anything. So it's a trigonometric cylinder. It's cosine. I'm trying to draw part of cosine in perspective. So this is part of z equals cosine of x. And that extends along the y-axis. It's a cylinder. It's parallel to the y-axis. All right. 
So that's what that is. And y equals zero means that we're only looking at, we're blocking it off on that side. And then what happens? Then we take the plane, z equals y, and we slice it through here. Now, I will try to draw this. So it will cut it. Yeah, not like that. Yeah, I think I should have gone out more on my, on my, So that is supposed to be a cut that I'm not particularly happy with by the plane. So I'm imagining that that thing is contained in the plane where z equals y. Now, there's a better picture in the book of this. My, of what I'm trying to draw. Maybe that's better. It's this wedge that's right in here. Right? On the top, it's bounded by this. On the, well, in our picture, on the left, it's bounded by y equals zero. And then it cuts, it cuts into y equals z, and so it's this, it's this wedge shape. It looks, well, it's this wedge right here that cuts in like that. How good does your picture need to be? <laughs> you might be looking at mine and going, oh my god, that's awful. But what's important is that what you can see easily in the picture is the projection into the XZ plane. This. So that if you draw, so this is our solid region, S. But if you project into the XZ plane, what you'll see is, is part of the cosine curve. But it gets chopped off. Um, it gets chopped off at the x-axis. Um, it doesn't extend below that because this plane y, z equals y is slicing through and that's the bounded region. So what does that mean? Well, for cosine, this is pi over 2, this is minus pi over 2, this is 1. So this is our region R. And now the question is, all right, so we're going to project into the xy, into the xz plane. That means that our inside integral is the missing coordinate. It's with respect to y. So we have this double integral over r. To get the volume, we need to just integrate 1 again. But the question is right now, what, what are our limits of integration for the y coordinate? And you just have to look at it. When you're at some point in our projected region, in that region, in the xz plane, your y-coordinates start over here at y equals 0 and go over to the y-coordinate on that slanted plane that, was, that created the slice. They always start at 0. They go, always go over to the y-coordinate on the slice. What is that y-coordinate in terms of your xz pair. Well, that plane is where y equals z. So you're starting at y coordinate 0 and going out to y equals z. So the limits of integration for y are very simple, 0 and z. Right? I never wrote that this is the triple integral, but it is. This is the triple integral over s of little blobs of volume bv, and it equals this. But now we need to set up the limits of integration to integrate over the region R. We'll just let x go from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. And for any x coordinate in there, the y coordinates start at 0 and go up to z equals the cosine of x. 
So what I'm saying is we're going to set this up as x is between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2. And your y coordinates always start at 0 and go up to the cosine of x. So our iterated integral for calculating the volume comes down to something that looks fairly simple. We'll have to use one little trig identity to actually get an answer, but it doesn't look very bad. We get the integral as x goes from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. The integral as y goes from 0 to cosine of x. The uh, not y, z goes from 0. Ah! Ha ha! <laughs> Over here, I said y is between 0 and cosine of x. That was a mistake. This was the xz plane. Whew. That should be a z. So that these are limits of integration on z. Limits of integration on y. Uh, you go from 0 to z, and then it's dy, dz, dx. So you just calculate this. It's not bad. At some point, you're going to have to integrate cosine squared. But that's standard. You can either look it up or use a trig identity. So, or, in fact, you could do it by integrate by parts, but I won't. You get the integral from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. Uh, the integral from 0 to cosine of x. The integral of dy is just y. And you put in z and subtract what you get at 0. So you just get z here, dz and dx. The integral of z dz, z squared over 2. So you get the integral from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2 of z squared over 2. Evaluate as z goes from 0 to the cosine of x. You plug in z as cosine of x, you subtract what you get when z is 0, we get integral from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2 of cosine squared x over 2, dx. Now this is a, a one variable calculus problem, not a particularly simple one variable calculus problem, but not a very bad one. You pull out the 1 half, and then it's just nicest to use the double angle formula. Cosine squared, or kind of double angle formula in reverse, is 1 plus the cosine of 2x over another 2. This isn't a mistake. I'm not, right, I already pulled out the 2 that was there, but you get another 2 here. And so you can pull out that half. You get a quarter. 1 quarter, you get times x plus the integral of cosine of 2x is the sine of 2x over 2. That's another divided by 2, right? That extra divided by 2 there comes from the chain rule in reverse. You can make the explicit substitution u equals 2x, but the derivative of sine of 2x is cosine of 2x times 2. So the derivative of this wipes out that extra times 2. It's cosine of 2x. I had already pulled out the, the 2 in that 2 so that you evaluate this from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. So you plug in x is pi over 2, and you get pi over 2 plus the sine of pi over 2, but the sine of pi is 0. So, and then you subtract what you get when you plug in minus pi over 2, and that's another minus pi over 2, and then you get another 0. So we get pi over 2 minus negative pi over 2, that's 2 times pi over 2, that's pi. Divided by 4, pi over 4. So basically, you know, roughly 3 quarters. Anyway, that's how you calculate volumes with triple integrals. They're as hard as they are to find projections into convenient coordinate planes. Drawing the pictures is the biggest, <laughs> is a difficulty. But the good news is your pictures don't have to be any better than my pictures. You just have to see the, basically, you need to see the relative positions of things and you need to see the good plane to project into, and that's, those are all the features, uh, and your projected region. And those are all the features you really care about trying to draw. All right, in the next
few sections, we're going to look at kind of, well, lots of other applications where we still have to write the limits of integration. That'll still be the main problem, but we won't keep integrating the constant function one 